Okay, go ahead and take a seat and open up your favorite book in the world. That is what? The Bible. Open up to Acts chapter 4, and we are in a wonderful study. And um, we are learning, as you may remember from last week, uh, from the very first followers of Christ. We're learning from those first disciples who were known as Christians. We're learning from them the answer to this basic question. What makes a great church? How would you answer the question? Someone already said it. <laughs> Jesus, the people. When I look, people following Christ. That's right. You know, when I look back over 25 years of being at this church, what makes Calvary Chapel to me a great church certainly uh, includes those, those things. I mean, that's really what it boils down to, right? It's, it's Jesus. The church is great because Jesus is great. And, and we don't really have to make it great. The way he intended it to be is, is already great because it reflects who he is. And that's what we're seeing in the book of Acts in chapter 4. The, the believers began to gather together, share life together, and the fruit of the Spirit began to be manifest in their lives in, a, in very practical but very powerful ways. And the fruit of the Spirit is love. And anybody that spent time around these first followers, if they wa went away knowing anything, they, they knew that these guys are people who love each other. Remember Jesus said, that is in fact how you people will know that you're my disciples, by your love for one another. And he told them that ahead of time. And here they are in this thing called the church. And indeed, that is what people are starting to notice. And it had a powerful effect in their community, in their world. And there are a number of things that we could say today that are just sort of characteristic of a great church, but it is great because of who Jesus is. It's also great because of the mission and the message that we have to share. And, and if we really know our master the way we claim to know, if we are truly following Jesus, then we're going to want to proclaim his message. And we're going to want to be living lives that are intentional for his sake. That's what it means to be on mission. We're, we're finishing what Jesus started. He said, now you go into the world and make disciples of all the nations. And so as our lives have been changed by this resurrected Christ, he then empowers us to go and be agents of change, if you will. The Bible calls us ambassadors for Christ. Now, think about this. We get to be made more and more into the image of Christ as we follow him and learn of him and just look upon him through the scripture and see his nature and, and see uh, just how attractive Jesus is. He, he's doing a couple of things. Well, number one, he's preparing us for heaven, right? He's, he's making us to, to reflect his image more and more. And we go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible and that's what God said of his creation. We were made in the image of God. And, and because of sin, we have, you know, the picture has been marred. We don't, in and of ourselves, reflect the true image of God until we turn from our sin and to a Savior. And he begins that work in us, that redemptive work. We become more like Jesus. Remember earlier in this very chapter, the people that were listening to their message and watching their lives, they made this observation, and it's powerful in its implications. They said they could tell that these people had been with Jesus. Man, they're, they're, they're saying what he said, and they're doing what he did, and man, these guys have been with Jesus, and it's true. Their lives had been deeply influenced by simply spending time with the Lord. And the, the takeaway for us is that, that we need to do the same thing. I mean, if we see this to be true even in human relationships, how much more powerful will the effect uh, of Christ himself be upon us? I mean, I look back on my life. If you were to spend, for example, even five minutes with me and my mother... It would explain a lot. You'd say, we can tell he's been with his mother. She raised me for 18 years, and with just a couple of exceptions, we're basically the same. 
I mean, we're different in, in only about two ways. Number one, she's a woman and I'm a man. But besides that, I'm way taller than her. It's just... <laughs> Four foot eleven. And so, what's my point? What guy could give back to me? <laughs> she had influence. And, you know, it's, it's, we need to live in the awareness that our time spent with Jesus is a very influential time. It, it, it's supposed to be that way. And these Christians are living intentional lives uh, that reflect their Lord. What, what happens when believers are becoming, actively cooperating with God and becoming more like Jesus, devoted to his purpose through our lives? You know what happens? We experience a great church, and the world gets to see a great picture, a great example of Jesus. And there's a reason that sinners wanted to hang out with Jesus, because when it was just him speaking to them, interacting with them, loving them, personally. They liked it. They wanted to. Now, we know from our study in the book of Luke, looking at the life and ministry of Jesus, I mean, he, he didn't ignore sin in their lives. And yet somehow sinners didn't feel condemned. They wanted to be with him. And the only time they got uncomfortable and didn't want to be with him is if he told them stuff they didn't want to hear and they had their own agenda. And they really... They really weren't interested in knowing him. They wanted something from him. But they didn't want the truth from him. They didn't want to actually see their lives be changed. But the people who recognized their need for him and they, they truly wanted to, to hear what he had to say and, and live the way he was calling them to live, uh, they, they were forever changed by that. And so it is uh, with us as well. And what does the world see when they look at us? Do they say, wow, there's something going on over there at Calvary Chapel. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I like it. I want to be a part of it. Those people, they know how to love well. And man, they love God. And because they love God, I feel loved. And, and, and the love of Christ should just be having this influence in our lives where we're just kind of dripping in it. You know what I'm saying? And it spills over into other people's lives. Pretty soon they start looking around and they're like, what is this stuff? <laughs> Drenched in it. It's called love. It's the love of Christ. Literally, literally, we should just be soaking in it and, and other people around us should be as well. Now, you remember last week, I'm going to read this passage again so that we can kind of keep ourselves anchored in, in uh, sort of the key thoughts. Um, verse 32, now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed each one as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land sold it, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And last week I pulled out a particular thought that I uh, will remind you of at this point, and it's just this idea of unity, the principle of unity. The first, one of the things that just really rises to the surface in this passage is that they were a people who had some things in common, namely a, a relationship now with Christ. They had that in common. And it changed everything for them. First, it began by changing their minds, the way they thought, the way they perceived the world around them. And then it began to get into their hearts and change them at a heart level so that they were motivated differently. They had a different value system. They had different priorities. You say, well, how do you really know that? Because it says they were of one heart and soul. And the heart and soul is kind of uh, the seat of your, your mind and your will and your emotions. It's, it's what moves you. It's where your passions for life come from. And when people uh, became, uh, came into a relationship with Christ by the Holy Spirit, 
all of a sudden, uh, they were just different. Now, there were things, like with all of us, you know, that change over time, but there were some things that changed, I mean, right now, on the spot. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Their hearts were changed. Their attitudes were changed. Their desires were changed. They still struggled with sin, like we all do, but they were heading in a brand new direction because that's what repentance is, right? Repentance is change. I'm going this way in my sin. My eyes are opened to the grace and the glory of God, and I start going this way now, and I'm following Jesus, and I'm watching him, and I'm learning from him, and I'm listening to him, and I want to be like him, and I want to love the way he loves, see? And all of a sudden, they had these things in common. That's what koinonia is. That's what fellowship is. We have Christ and everything about him in common. And it changes our mind. It changes our heart. And eventually, it changes our life. How do we know that? Because it says they started sharing like everything, their possessions, their, their houses, their stuff, their money. Uh, they just began this one another ministry that was so dynamic and so powerful. I mean, just stop and think about this for a minute. Would you be willing, literally, right now, if Jesus said to do it, would you be willing to sell your home and downsize and live in something that's, that's adequate, you know, it meets your needs, but you don't have that three-car garage and the boat and all that stuff? And listen, I'm not attacking anybody for stu having stuff, but what I'm saying, I want you to understand the, the principle. Do you understand how radical it was that people all of a sudden... Their things weren't theirs anymore. They were owners of nothing and stewards of everything. And they started looking around, realizing, hey, Jesus said he was going to come back, like, soon. And frankly, I don't care about all this stuff anymore. It just doesn't matter. If, in fact, Jesus is returning, hey, we better get busy and start telling people this truth. And, and it just didn't matter anymore. And this was why it was such a powerful work of the Holy Spirit. Only God can do that. To change a heart to such a degree that you start, you not only open up your heart, but you open up your hands. You're not clinging to your stuff anymore. You just, you're just like, how can I help? How can I serve? What do you need? Let me meet the need. And, and, you know, and they didn't just all become destitute overnight together, just give away everything. But it said, as they had need. So as needs arose, if somebody had something they didn't need, they could give it to someone else, or, or maybe they could just sell it and take the proceeds to meet another need over here. They didn't have organized church the way we do today. They, they just, it was just everyday people looking around and seeing needs. And remember the context. I mean, these were pilgrims, not like, you know, Thanksgiving Day, not like that. So... You just got a picture of a guy with a hat. No, it, they, were, they were people who had, had made these pilgrimages from distant lands and they came to practice their faith, their religion in Jerusalem and the day of Pentecost happened and, and they didn't, you know, they, they weren't locals, okay? They didn't, they didn't go home after Pentecost. What they did is the apostles started teaching them and, and they started to become fed spiritually. They were learning things about God they just didn't know before. And it was powerful and transformative. And all of a sudden they're going, man, we, we, we got to hear more of this. Honey, we're not going home yet. You know, get the kids. We're going to church, you know. <laughs> and they just, they just would hang around the apostles and they listened to the teaching and it's, they started to realize, well, you know, we need a place. Hey, do you need a place to stay? Yeah, we got an extra room. Well, let's just, you can stay with us, you know. And people just started to share their stuff because th there were all these displaced people who were now followers of Jesus, but they had a lot to learn. Like, what's that going to mean in my life practically? And if they go home, what are they going home to? Paganism. You know, they're going back to a godless uh, community. And they're not ready for this. They're not equipped for this. I mean, they, they know enough to know the gospel. I was blind and now I see. Jesus has forgiven me. I'm filled with his spirit. He's, he's changing my heart. I really care about the things he cares about now. I want to love people well. I want to live differently. I, I'm, I'm turning away from this sin and that sin. And they had to learn they needed instruction. And so they just thought, let's just keep doing this church thing, you know. And then so they gathered together. 
It was powerful, but there was a unity. You see, the Holy Spirit was working in a way that created a sense of community and intimacy that was unparalleled. Nobody would ever, ever, ever in history seen anything like this. It was totally brand new. It was real. And a watching world was watching this. Now, I don't know how this hits you, but it hits me pretty hard. I'm going, Lord, am I like this? Are we like this? Would people say this is typical of us? Uh, I mean, we're, we're outspoken about this, but are our hearts and our hands open? Are we ready to part with our stuff? Are we ready to speak up? See, that's the next thing we learn in the text is, is they started preaching the resurrection. There was powerful preaching going on. You know, isn't it interesting that in the early church, uh, they were trying to get people to shut up Today in the church, the Holy Spirit's trying to get us to speak up. What are you ashamed of? Are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you ashamed of Christ? And there was this attack externally that we, we learned in this last several weeks, this series on persecution. That's how Satan first attacked externally. When we get to uh, Acts chapter 5 next week, we're going to learn about an internal attack because that totally failed. I mean, people got more bold. They prayed, God, give us boldness to keep doing what got us in trouble in the first place. I mean, they were committed to the message and they were definitely on mission. They were totally serious about being like Jesus. And it had a powerful effect. That's why just a handful of people became thousands almost overnight. Within just a few short weeks, there are tens of thousands of people that aren't just going to church, just a different type of being religious. They were going to church before. But they're going for a different reason now, see. They were leaving church changed. They said, we're gonna live differently. See, what makes a great church? That's what makes a great church. Church is great when people are living like their Savior who is so great. And, and it just, it was powerful. It was, there was this intimacy to the community. There was this joyful sharing. And I mean, this was a happy bunch of people. Nobody, was, this wasn't compulsory. It was voluntary. Nobody said, all right, now you get in line. Look, if you're gonna do church, this how it's done. From this day forward, you bring your stuff right here at my feet. Leave it there and I'll take care. They didn't do that. This is what was so astonishing. It was just the Holy Spirit. People, nobody had to twist their arms and say, hey, can you help a brother out? They just did it. They just did it. Would that be said of our church? Can that be said of you personally? Now listen, as I go through this, I want you to understand, uh, this is very convicting to me. Even as your pastor, I'm having to kind of look at all this personally in my own life. And, and, I, and, and so I understand, I don't want anybody to go out of here today feeling condemned. If you go out of here feeling, I don't mind if you go out of here feeling convicted, okay? <laughs> Conviction's good. The Holy Spirit, conviction will always dry, draw you closer to the Lord. Condemnation drives us away from the Lord. Do you know why? It has to do with where the voice is coming from. Condemnation comes from the enemy. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. It's okay if God makes us all a little uncomfortable. Do you agree with that? It's okay to be uncomfortable. God is changing us. There's things we should be uncomfortable about. And they never compromised the message. They spoke up. And, and the gospel, the Bible says, is an offense to those who are perishing. Now, we don't ever want to proclaim it in an offensive way meaning we're unkind or unloving or critical or all that kind of nonsense. But, but the gospel itself is going to necessarily uh, pierce hearts and it's gonna be offensive. If I love my stuff more than I love God, if I'm more interested in my agenda than God's agenda, then I'm gonna get a little upset if someone starts telling me about God and his agenda. I start to feel a little guilty. But you know, the Lord is inviting you to be a part of what he's doing in this world. He's not, um, it's compelling, but it's not coercive. God, you know, just doesn't drag you around by the hair. I mean, it's follow me. You either do or you don't. And, and there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But you know, I've found there's a lot of discomfort 
as the Lord starts to expose areas of my heart where I've got these little idols and this stuff that I'm clinging to. And he says, no, I got more for you. I got better for you. And if this is gonna be the church, the true church, the way God intended, which is great and always has been great, then we have got to ask ourselves, are we lining up with God's heart in these areas? And so don't go away feeling like the pastor just gave us a spanking this morning because uh, I'm having to deal with this stuff too in my own life and say, Lord, is, is this me? Like, is this really describe me? Do I have this generosity? Do I have this joy? Do I have this other-centeredness? Do I have this love that just oozes out of me because of, of, of Christ in me? That's what we're supposed to be experiencing. And the grace of God, what happens is if, if there's this, this intimacy, this unity, this fellowship, and, and everybody's being obedient and on mission proclaiming the good news of this resurrected Christ, necessarily what happens is people start to, to respond uh, because God, by his grace, does something through that. See, God's grace is unmerited favor. What I'm saying to you is, is when you are intimate with him and with one another, and when you are obedient to his call and on mission and preaching his message, guess what? It makes God happy, right? He is pleased with you. He smiles on you. The grace of God is upon you. But the whole motivation is different. Don't hear me say, if you just do that, then God will do this. So just check that box, jump through that hoop, be a little more religious, try a little harder, and then God will do this. I'm not saying that. Here's the difference between religion and grace. Religion says, I obey, therefore I'm accepted. Grace says, I am accepted, therefore I obey. We obey and we love and we do these things not to try to get something from God, if we're truly saved, we've already received everything that really matters. And that's why um, the Bible says we're, we are, our identity in Christ and our security in Christ, it, it's, that's where it's at. It's in Christ. It's not in our performance, anything that we do or don't do. And so I hope you hear me saying that, that we're people of grace. We understand grace. We're dispensers of grace. And, and it's a powerful thing. People aren't used to that. They don't know what to do with grace. See, we grow up in a world saying, you gotta earn it, man, especially in America. I mean, you gotta pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's just how we get it done. And, and we, it's just all about works, 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 works. Self-salvation. And the gospel of grace comes and just blows that out of the water and says, this is something so far superior. This is just better. But you gotta humble yourself, see, that's where the rub comes. If you're gonna receive something from God by his grace, you can't go around acting like you didn't receive it. And that's why a lot of people choose not to follow Jesus is because it's very disarming to follow Jesus. You gotta, you gotta set aside your script. You gotta, you gotta all of a sudden say, you know what? Um, I got nothing but you. And here I am, God, just use me. Just use me, I'll trust you, I'll follow you, and, and then everything changes. Everything changes. And this is what's so powerful, what's happening. Now what I want to do today is I want to, I want to come at this from a different angle because you say, okay, I think we know what a, what a great church is supposed to be from this text. The, you're going to see the characteristic of a great church, God's great church, is there's a unity, there's an intimacy, there's a fellowship, there's, there's just... People loving each other really well and loving Jesus supreme. And, and, and it has a powerful effect and the message we proclaim is powerful. And when we testify and we bear witness of what's, what is real and what is true and who God is and all he's done and we're just doing this, pointing people to Christ and telling of the cross and the resurrection, all that stuff, it has a powerful effect. And, and this grace is so refreshing to people who all they've ever known is religion. All they've ever known is works. All they've ever known is performance. And, and all of a sudden, it just, you take a sigh of relief. You go, oh, you mean he'll just love me? God accepts me in the beloved, in Christ? 
See, Jesus did everything you could never do. He lived the perfect life you could never live. So the reason you're acceptable, if you humble yourself and for, turn from your sin and put your trust in the Lord, he says, you're acceptable now to me because I don't just, I'm not looking at your sin. I'm looking at your sin that's covered by the blood of Christ. I see you now. You're acceptable to me because of what I did on your behalf. You see? And that's the gospel. That's what's good news. It's not something you go out and do. It's something Jesus has already done. Now, what do you suppose would happen in your life personally? You say, this is basic stuff, John. I think I, Christianity 101. I, thanks for the brush up course, but I already kind of knew that stuff. Listen, we never outgrow these truths. I'm still, after 45 years of walking with the Lord, 40 years, I'm losing track, maybe 40 years. I, I'm still trying to figure out, what does it mean to be transformed by grace? What will that mean in my marriage? What will that mean with my kids? What will that mean with my neighbor and in the workplace? If, if I'm someone who's just filled with grace, how do I treat people? How does that mean in my conversations, my attitude, my tone, how I talk to my employees or, or my, uh, my employer? How do I live when nobody else, I think nobody else is watching? What does the favor of God do in my life in those practical areas. Let me tell you one thing the grace of God did for me as a young father. I, I didn't uh, grow up, as, as you know, with my dad in the home, single parent, family. And so I was afraid to be a dad. But you know how God's, what God's grace looked like for me? Is I realized if I'm gonna be on mission with Jesus, then my, my first initial mission field is my children. And while I didn't have a dad tucking me in bed at night, I realized very early on that if I was going to be a, a, a dispenser of grace, of God's favor, and of God's truth, if I was going to have influence in my children's lives spiritually, I needed to be there tucking them into bed at night, kissing them on the forehead. Actually, I, honest, I kissed them a lot more than that. I just, I just smothered them with, with kisses. I just, I look back, and I, I think I'm going to be a great grandpa. My kids tell me I will because I just love little kids, and I, I can't get enough of them, and I didn't want them to grow up because I just love to love them. And so, but, but I didn't ever get that growing up in that way, and so I didn't know. I just had to trust God. He says, hey, this is what grace looks like. Open up a little children's ministry, or little children's story Bible, and read to them. Tell them about me. Listen to them and pray with them. And John, I'm giving you that privilege every single night of your life. Go do it. Oh, man. Is that what I did? No, I was like, yay, God, I love your grace. I get to be on mission with God, reaching these little people. Now, some of you might say, oh, you know, I get it, but I can't really do that. Here's my circumstance or whatever. And again, no condemnation. That's just a, a practical example because many of you can do that and you may not be doing that. But I, I, gotta, I, want, I want you to understand the practical handles on this, what it might look like. For some of you, that's what it might look like. If that's not how it can look in your life, don't go away feeling bad about it. Just say, okay, what would it look like in my life? See, in marriage, what it looks like for me is, and with my kids all the way along in parenting, here's what grace also looked like. I, I needed to let them be different. I, let them, I needed to let them just be them and not a little clone of me. But see, I'm inclined to be very critical and I think I know how you should be and how you should live and how you should act and I want to fix and change people. <laughs> I'm sure I'm the only one in this room that does that, but that's just my thing. And so what grace looked like in parenting for me is I had to let my wife be different. I had to let my kids be different, just be who they are without trying to make them feel like they're always falling short of my standard or failing me in some way. And you know, I found to the degree that I'm learning to do that, my family thrives. And I can tell when it's not thriving and when they're like, uh -uh, let us up for air, dad. Because I'm, I'm just squeezing the life out of them because I'm not, I'm not parenting in a gracious way. They have the freedom to be different. They have the freedom, listen, they had a freedom to make mistakes. My wife has freedom to not be the perfect wife and she gives me the freedom. I mean, she has to by default give me the freedom to not be a perfect husband. It'd just be unrealistic any other way. And the thing is, but this is what grace looks like. 
So some of you may, like me, struggle with being critical. And you can always justify it because you always you say, this, is, this would be good for you. <laughs> See, it says so in the Bible. But, but listen, grace, that's what grace looked like. And I wonder in this early church, the tr- these truths getting into these people's hearts, what did it look like in their life? They were married. They had families. They worked. They were with, you know, I mean, they did life with other people. What did grace look like? That's what it looked like, it is looking like in my life in some ways. So do you understand, though? You start to think through these principles. What would it mean? How, how would this principle of unity change your life personally? Maybe for some of you, you're just, you don't really like people. You're like, oh, you know, the life group thing, John, fine, I get it. But listen, I've never really liked people. And, and, you, <laughs> and maybe, uh, maybe there's reasons for that. Maybe you've been hurt. Maybe you're wounded. You just think this, you know, it just, I'm just it's not my thing. I'm kind of an introvert. And I understand all of that. But the gospel doesn't just apply to certain personalities or people who've had certain experiences but not other experiences. God says we need intimacy and community and fellowship. He said it. And so what are we doing to experience that? I, I need to see examples of other people who are living this Bible out and taking it seriously. I've got to see it. And I, that means I've got, to spend light, I've got to spend time, meaningful time, building relationships with other believers. And it can be messy. I know that. Believe me. I've gone through some messes with people over the years. Oh, but our lives are the richer for it. And God works in a powerful way in his community. You realize it was a new humanity. It was a redeemed humanity. It was a new society. This was a new, this was new. The world had never seen this, though God said it's coming all the way along through the prophets, all the way through the scriptures. It's coming. Now, I want to take a minute to, I said, come at this from another angle because here's the deal. People are leaving the church today in record numbers all over the world. Do you know why? Now, I'm not saying it's all bad. There's also, you know, a lot of people coming to Christ. But do you know what the difference is? Why do some churches seem to be just blessed and fruitful and growing and thriving and other churches, not so much? They're just, they're dead. Why? How many of you know George Bar- the Barna Research Group? Have you ever heard of Barna? No hands? A couple people? Barna Research? They do surveys and they do studies and they, they study culture. And they study trends and they say, you know, here's different trends that we see in church culture. Here's what we see in the world. And, and here's what we see among the millennials and this generation. And, and so a number of years ago, there was a study on why um, millennials are leaving church. Why is it that people under 30 just, they don't, they, don't, <laughs> they don't have time for church? Listen, this is going to be a little bit like a slug in the gut, but I'm processing this and I'm not trying to slug you in the gut. Let it be, let it touch your heart, okay? Let it touch your heart. Church is irrelevant and full of hypocrites. Yikes. And... There's too much moral failure. You say, John, that's three things. Yes. Do you know why? Because that's how people think. They lump it all together. When a person says to you, maybe you've said this, maybe you've heard it said, I got nothing, you got nothing to say to me, man. Don't tell me about your Jesus. Don't tell me about your church. Don't tell me about your God. Doesn't apply to my life. It's irrelevant. Tried that. Been there, done that. Not interested. It's irrelevant. Why? Just a bunch of hypocrites. Why? Because I was in a church and, and there was the, the, the leadership did this or did that. See, they lump it all together. That's why it's irrelevant. Because they see these things lumped together. Now, I'll say this. That's not going to fly when they stand before God someday. You can't say, well, it's those stinking hypocrites over there. That's why I rejected you. Everybody has to stand before the Lord on their own. But... We've got to be honest and we've got to be humble and ask ourselves, uh, do we contribute to this perception? Because we live in a, you understand, we live in a culture 
<laughs> big time, where perception is reality to most people. And it's irrelevant. Now, is this actually true? Well, it is full of hypocrites, and there's plenty of room for one more. <laughs> like, we all fall short. We, we all can be hypocrites. That's a cop-out. That's an excuse, right? We know that. That's a smokescreen. But it's still legitimate because some people have had bad experiences legitimately. And, and, and we have to own that as followers of Christ. Are we representing Christ or are we not representing Christ? Now, none of us does it perfectly, but to be honest, I have found nobody expects that. Unbelievers don't expect Christians to be perfect. What just irks them is when Christians try to sound like they are and they know they're not. And a hypocrite is an actor. It's a mask. It's wearing a mask. That's what's so repulsive to people who are, who are leaving church. They don't like the, the game of pretend. They want something authentic. And so it's very important that we think this through in our own life. A next, another thing that I think is important as we consider what makes a great church. Well, we've got to see what, what, what makes a not so great church. Listen to this. God is missing how does that happen at church? Like, that's the whole reason we go, is to find God. God's missing? Well, then what in the world are we doing? Is this just a social club, you know? And some churches are like that. Now, I would not say that's a defining characteristic of Calvary Chapel. But I think we'd be a little bit arrogant and dishonest if we thought that uh, we, could, we could never be guilty of that. That we could never be deceived or distracted or, or, or off mission or off center a little bit in this way or that way. And, and you know what, what really, and when you look at this study, what, it, what they were talking about is um, there wasn't spiritual maturity. No, there, there wasn't somebody helping them understand what does an experience with God actually mean? What does it look like? Do you wonder that? Maybe you're a new Christian. You're saying, well, I've been coming, John, and I'm, I'm, listen, I'm doing the best I can trying to understand what you're preaching, and, and, and it's good, it's helpful, but, but I still need help. I, I'm not sure exactly what this whole experiencing God looks like. And this is why community is so important. Because we start to minister to one another and it's good to get together with other believers who are a little further down the path in their faith journey. And if you, if you don't quite know how prayer works, ask a Christian. Who, 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 seem, who appears to be, at least, um, you know, have some maturity. You're, see, you're watching their life, and you see good things, and you say, you know what, um, can you tell me about prayer? I mean, this is so fundamental. It's a conversation with God. We, we talk to him. We listen to him. It's, it's, it's part of how we do experience intimacy with God. But what, what the study is showing is that people aren't getting that at church. I mean, they just, it's not authentic, and they want something real. And so we, as believers, have to minister to one another and be reaching out to those folks and help them see what it means to have a true experience with God. It's why we study the Bible. I mean, we're not just filling our, our heads with knowledge. We want to be healthy sheep, but that requires exercise. We don't want to be fat sheep. All right? Some people, I mean, they're just out of shape. You say, round is a shape. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> we could just, we, we can have, we can be so full of the word, but we're not actually, it's just knowledge, we're not actually living it out, you see? And we don't want to be fat sheep. We want to be healthy. And, and healthy sheep reproduce. And, but, but God should, it should never be said of our church. You know, it's fine. I mean, the music was good and they seemed nice enough, but where's God? Like, I don't know how to really know God. I had a guy call me one time out of the blue, got a phone call, and he just said, you know, I think I'm hearing uh, from God, but I, I've never been to a church in my life, and I, I just need somebody to tell me how to know God. Um, that's like a pastor's dream, yeah, I could tell you about God, you know. And he and his friend came in, and I spent a, some time with them just telling them about God. And, you know, they gave their lives to Christ that day. Now, listen, I'm not boasting in me. I'm saying that pe people are that hungry. There are people that, that they, this, it may be their last stop in life, their last attempt to try to find God, and they come here. Do they find that he's missing? Or do they experience the love of Christ? 
The power of community, this intimacy, this fellowship. There's something that they go away going, man, I don't know what just happened, but I like it. And over time, they learn what's going on, you see. Well, there's another thing. I've got to wrap up here pretty quick. Oh, this one. Oh, my goodness. We could talk a long time about this. Legitimate doubt is prohibited. Now, I talked a bit on this last week a bit, if you remember. Um, is this a church where people can come with their doubts, their questions, their fears, and, and are they going to feel like we're all judgy about it? Or are they going to say, you know what? Um, can you help me with this? What, what, are they gonna, what, are they, what kind of vibe are they going to get here? Are we holier than thou? Are we, too, are, are, are we too perfect that people can't come in with all their stuff and all their doubts and fears and questions and say, hey, man, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand, but I just don't. And you know, some of you maybe have been coming here for some time. Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I know if everybody was honest, every hand would go up. Do you still, do you have some doubts? Those of you who profess Christ, you're Christians. It's not a question of whether or not you're Christian. But do you have a few doubts? Do you have some questions for God? We all do. Why do we act like we don't? Why, why is it that people come away feeling like we got it all dialed in and all the answers, you know, and if anybody struggles with questions or with sin, we just, we, we're just... Like you're not Christian, you're just, you're not very spiritual and all that. Uh, by the way, I'm not suggesting we just em embrace everything and, and, and not take sin seriously. But can we take sinners seriously? When they come and they ask questions, they need answers. You know what I do about this is, is I just ask I, I will let people share their story, and if I don't know an answer, everybody expects the pastor to have just a ready answer, you know, and I try, but there's a lot of stuff I don't have a good answer for. I just tell people, you know, that's a great question. I'm not sure. I don't have a very good answer uh, right now. Could I help you find the answer? What this is going to mean very practically is, is we have got to uh, be willing to roll up our sleeves, open our Bibles, find each other, and we need to find the answers because God's given them to us in his book. So many people say, why doesn't God speak to me? He's already spoken. It's called the Bible. And he will continue to speak through the Bible. And he will speak through other Christians. But we've got to be humble and teachable and honest and willing to say, you know, that is a great question. Let's find the answer together. And if you do that as a habit of life, pretty soon you're going to have more, more answers than questions in terms of the big stuff. You know, there'll come a point where you really do know Christ and how to make him known. That's very attractive because there's a lot of people hurting with desperate questions that need, they desperately need answers to their questions. You know, some of you might be struggling with something and, 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 and you, you would never feel safe, especially in a Christian circle, to be honest about this. Maybe you struggle with same-sex attraction, for example, and you go, oh, did the pastor just say what I think he said? Hey, listen, I know how it is. I know that people are struggling with things like this. And the last place that they ever speak up and ask an honest question is in a group of Christians. And we've got to trust the Lord enough, love people enough to say, hey, let's have an honest conversation about this. Is this too big of a question for God? Is this too big of a problem for God? I, I just, I, I, I am thinking this through in my own life and I encourage you to do the same. Do people feel free to have their doubts and their questions and be able to come? Man, this should be the safest place in the world to do that. Let it never be said of us that this is, you know, the church shoots their wounded or, you know, some of these things that people say. This is a hospital. This is where people come for healing. So let's do that. Let's be that. That's part of what it means to be a great church. Not learning about God. Now, this one I had to take real personal because I'm the teaching pastor for, you know, the main teaching pastor. So I'm like, if people go out of here, if you leave here today and you didn't learn anything about God, then some of that's got to be on me, right? I need to really work hard at communicating God's truth. And if I don't do that, then people go away coming to the conclusion, and it's a wrong one, but, but they, the, the, maybe God doesn't have answers. And so I work really hard to study this book and to prepare so that I am a good communicator of the gospel. 
But I got to tell you, as much as I have to own that, you also have to own that. Look around you. Do you see some empty chairs? I do. I see spaces for people who need Jesus. And I hope you don't depend on the pastor to do all the heavy lifting. And to say, well, I don't know, I'll let John preach the gospel. I'll let John give an invitation to Christ. I'll let, I'll let John do, I'll answer everybody's burning questions. Well, I'm doing the best I know how. But, you know, God says he gives gifts, spiritual gifts, according to measure. I only have so much of a gift. <laughs> There are people that I, I will never be an incredibly dynamic speaker, probably. You know, there's, there's churches that grow, but it's a superficial growth because it's around a personality and someone's incredibly gifted at communicating. And I'm not talking about filling seats in that way. If that seat's gonna be filled next to you, it's gonna be because you do this. Listen carefully. You start making a list. I do this. I make a list of people that I start praying for. Step number one, make a list, real names, real people in your sphere of influence and make a commitment to start praying for them on a regular basis. Step one, make the list. Step two, pray fervently, perseveringly. Step three, invite them into your life. Invest in their life. Give them some of your time, some of your attention. Invest in them. Start in your family, start with your friends, start whoever at work, start. It doesn't have to be a long list. Be realistic. Don't put 25 people down if you're not gonna do it. Maybe it's two people. But start, make the list, start praying, and then start investing. I don't get to step four until I've done the first three most of the time. See, most people here, invite people to church. I like to say, invite them into your life and then invite them to church. Now, you can do it the other way around too, but I'm just saying don't be surprised if they don't come. I'll bet if I asked for a show of hands, how many of you came to church the very first time you were asked, probably very few hands would come up. That's great, but that's rare. How about the second time? How about the third time? How about the fourth time? Some of you, it took a, quite a bit of time before you finally said, okay. And even then, it took maybe even longer before you responded to the invitation to come to Christ. See, that's just people. But, but we've got to be intentional about that. And, and, and we've got to share that responsibility, help people learn of God. Last, last thing, and I'll, be, I'll close with this. Not finding community. Everything that I've just said, that this word has just said, and I've unpacked it in as practical a way as I know how, everything requires connectedness. It's, relation, it's a relationship-rich environment. People have to honestly connect. After the service, you'll have opportunities to do that. You can look around at the different ministries. There's all kinds of ways you can serve and connect and learn and grow together if you choose to. Let it never be said of our church, from this day forward, will you commit to this with me? Nobody should out-community a church. Hello? <laughs> Would you agree with that? Like, we're made for this. This is how the church was born. We are made for community. People leave the church because they come to churches and they don't find authentic relationships. And it takes everybody that having that value, that kind of relationship with Christ. Will you stand with me? Lord, we thank you for today, for your word, every bit of it, Lord. And I... I I pray that if there's anything that I've said in, in some way that's been not helpful or a distraction or just not right exactly true, that you just give, a, give people the grace to kind of um, overlook um, my stumbles along the way. But I'm confident, Lord, that these principles are right there in your word and it's true because of you, not because of my ability or lack thereof, Lord. I pray that you'd help people to see the truth, to see your grace, to see how desperately we need you and one another. Help us, Lord, to be people who have been so transformed by this message in our own lives that we just get really excited about passing it on. I pray, Lord, that, that, um, that you would, it would be our joy to reach out and embrace others and invite them to Jesus. May it be something we all take in a deeply personal way. And um, Lord, we thank you for your grace, for your power, and for making us one in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.